Welcome to Failed Utopia, the podcast about utopian ideas and paradise lost. We look at utopian concepts of the past, present, and future, as well as utopian societies and communes, which promise the world to eager followers, but inevitably fail when it all starts to unravel. Hello again, friends. This is Anna, your shining golden podcast host. On this episode, we're talking about an eco village in Scotland. There won't be any maniacal cult leaders or rattlesnake bites on this one, but there will be fairies, nature spirits, failed guru takeovers, and meditation in the public toilet at an RV park. Some people would argue this isn't a failed utopia at all. You might believe that by the end of this episode. I'm not even sure it's a failure, but the first thing I learned about Findhorn sure sounded like a fail to me, in terms of creating a utopia anyway. So let's start there. I was listening to a random episode of the podcast, The Jim Rutt Show, and his guest mentioned he'd spent time at the Findhorn Eco Village. Jim shared a little personal story from 25 or 30 years ago, when a friend of his who observed Findhorn gardening techniques asked him to save the bladder if he got a buck during deer hunting season. Huh? Fun fact about me. My brother is a farmer. He knows a lot about growing plants. When I'm in my tractor, I got more power than an arc reactor. And when I'm in the field, I try to raise crops to maximum yield. This how I roll. Without me, the world be out of control. The hours I work, there is no equal. Gotta feed the mouths of hungry people. Ah, gotta feed everybody. Ah, gotta feed everybody. Ah, gotta feed everybody. Ah, uh huh. I work outside. Ah, gotta feed everybody. Ah, gotta feed everybody. Ah, gotta feed everybody. Ah, uh huh. I work outside. When I step to the bump, yeah, this is what I see. Uh huh. All the hungry cattle are staring at. Plants and I ain't afraid to show it, show it, show it, show it. I'm farming and I grow it. When I heard about this bladder thing, I thought, damn it, I'm gonna get to the bottom of this. So I sent my farmer brother the following one sentence text message Is a buck bladder a useful item for farming slash growing plants? His response was, a what? After clarifying that I did in fact mean the urinary organ from a male deer, he posited that one might possibly be able to repurpose it as a watering can, given the built-in spout. What I took from this exchange was that I'm not alone in never having heard of this, and buckbladders don't seem to be a thing in mainstream farming. I liked his suggestion, but that's not how Finhorn uses them, as I would soon find out. It turns out, in biodynamic farming, what you need to do is ferment a bunch of yarrow flowers inside said stag bladder and apply it to your compost with some other stuff, like oak bark fermented in a domestic animal's skull and dandelions fermented in cow mesentery. What is cow mesentery? Well, it's some kind of membrane found in the abdominal cavity that surrounds the digestive tract. I'm sure you all have some of that lying around. Apparently, another practice from Fintorn-style agriculture is mixing up some concoction inside a bull's horn, stir it so many times clockwise and counterclockwise under a full moon, and then bury these things in the four corners of your field. Now, some of you who know me in real life might be thinking, Anna, you do some really weird shit. That sounds exactly like something you would do. And yeah, it kind of does. I might try it. I have a garden. Or I might make a midnight run over to my brother's farm and try it out there. I don't know. So what is the deal with this Findhorn place? First off, I'll clarify that I'm speaking about the Findhorn Eco Village, not to be confused with the nearby fishing town of Findhorn, 
Same name, different place. In 1962, Eileen and Peter Caddy and their three children left the Clooney Hill Hotel in Northeast Scotland, which the Caddies had been managing for the past six years before they were fired. They headed for the remote Finhorn Bay Caravan Park and parked their 30-foot caravan, or trailer as we'd call it in America, expecting to stay for only about six months, but they never left. Why? It was all because Eileen claimed she received guidance from God, and this is what they were told to do. It seems that the caddies may have later recast these circumstances as a spiritual decision rather than a necessity after becoming unemployed. Regardless, they made the Findhorn Caravan Park their new home. Soon, they were joined there by family friend Dorothy McLean. They didn't really know why they were there, but Eileen kept listening for a sign from God of what to do next. And what she was told next was to go down to the public toilet in the caravan park. She took to meditating in the last stall and had what she considered a wonderful experience receiving guidance. What she took from this was a lesson. A lesson that God is within you. It doesn't matter where you are because God is everywhere and you carry that God with you. Even into the toilet. Or in this case, especially into the toilet. The caddies were unable to find work, so the family subsisted on eight pounds a week in dole money, i.e. social security payments, and started a garden to supplement their diet. The family friend, Dorothy, gave Peter Caddy gardening guidance that she believed came from nature spirits she called devas, which were described as angels that overlight the different vegetables. For whatever reason, and despite the poor sandy soil of the northern Scotland caravan park, the vegetables in their patch grew abnormally large and attracted some attention from the media. I guess it was a slow news day. Anyway, in 1969, the BBC featured them on a TV program, and the secret was out. People attracted to Eileen's spiritual messages and Peter and Dorothy's apparent gardening acumen started flocking to the community, and it expanded rapidly throughout the 1970s. The Caddies and Dorothy McLean would say many times in the following years that they never intended to create a community at Findhorn. It just happened. You might not think a rundown trailer park next to a dump in the desolate, austere, windswept highlands of Scotland with a lady meditating and hearing from God in the toilets would be a particularly attractive proposition for new converts. I've seen two interviews in which Eileen Caddy asked herself some version of, who'd want to come to a dump like this? But they did come. The Caddies and Dorothy McLean had connections to certain people with occultist and non-denominational spirituality leanings who were interested in the spiritual possibilities emerging at the Findhorn Caravan Park. In the 1940s, Eileen had been married to a British Royal Air Force officer, Andrew Combe, who introduced her to a movement known as Moral Rearmament. Moral Rearmament, or MRA, was a spiritual movement dating from the 1920s that gained popularity during Europe's military rearmament in the late 30s. The movement had Christian roots, but focused primarily on the personal pursuit of four moral absolutes, purity, unselfishness, honesty, and love, as a means of working toward change in the world. Eileen wasn't particularly religious, but she agreed to attend MRA meetings with her husband and participate in quiet times when the group would listen for divine guidance. Around that time, Peter Caddy was married to spiritual teacher Sheena Govan, who was known for helping guide people through what she described as the birth of Christ within. Peter Caddy was also an RAF officer, and Andrew Combe introduced him to his wife, Eileen, 
leading to a very messy series of events involving Peter and Eileen falling in love, divorces, and ugly custody disagreements. Ultimately, Eileen went to join Sheena Govan's band of followers, leading to more messiness, Eileen and Peter living together and having a couple of kids, more custody issues, and falling out with Peter's wife Sheena and going their separate ways. That's when Peter and Eileen found work at the Clooney Hill Hotel, along with their close friend and fellow Sheena Govan follower, Dorothy McLean. Through these connections with early New Age groups and Eileen's writings about her experiences of God speaking to her, a few people started trickling into the caravan park to join them, and it grew from there. Dorothy McLean left Findhorn in 1973 to pursue other opportunities in America, but retired and returned to Findhorn in 2010. Peter and Eileen separated in the late 70s, and Peter left Findhorn, leaving Eileen the matriarch of the community they founded until her death in 2006. Today, the Eco Village has over 400 residents and has expanded from a few caravans to many, along with some charming eco friendly cabins, small houses, and cozy round cottages with light, airy interiors and sort of a Scandinavian vibe. Per their beliefs, the village is not imposed on the landscape, but integrated into it. Room and board are free for residents, for which they exchange work in the community, and they receive about £200 per month in pay. In addition to residences, the village boasts a school, a college, and several shops and restaurants. 90% of the community's income today comes from tourism. Thousands of people visit Findhorn every year, hoping for a transformative experience. They pay for the privilege and participate in meditation and courses on things like sustainability and contacting your guardian angel, but are also put to work during their stay, cooking, gardening, building, or even cleaning and scrubbing toilets. Leadership of the village is non-centralized. The three founders, despite Eileen's guidance direct from God, never took a firm, authoritarian role, leaving much of the governance to the group itself. There's a management team of several individuals who make bigger decisions that affect the wider community. The management team collaborates with the council, which is a group of about 40 committed long-term community members. One member described the management team as a core group that holds the community on a spiritual level, but also serves as a body of consciousness to incarnate the changes they are invoking. They would meditate to receive guidance from their inner God to make any major decisions for the community and only proceed with group consent. There are also trustees of the Findhorn Foundation, who the council and management team must report to. Different departments within the community are largely allowed to devise their own work methods for accomplishing their responsibilities. Over the years, Findhorn has been approached by wannabe leaders who wish to take a formal position of authority over the community. In one case, in the 90s, a guru traveled from India for a discovery trip to see if an arrangement with Findhorn would be mutually compatible. Ultimately, the guru left Findhorn empty-handed. People at Findhorn had no desire to be ruled over, and the guru criticized the community for their lack of literal and specific commitment to traditional religion. He considered them spiritual anarchists, for deliberately not choosing any specific person to be their guru. The visit was amicable, but it was clear their two visions were not compatible. Findhorn's very decentralized management system has the benefit of allowing community members to have a say and keep things as collaborative as possible but it also has the predictable drawback of occasional episodes of the decision-making process getting bogged down with no clear path forward. 
In one case, a committee in charge of creating a new logo for the community spent over a year discussing, meditating, and calling on their spirit guides with little to no progress made, much to the frustration of the actual graphic designer who likely could have come up with a few workable options very easily if left to the task without all the meditating and asking angels for direction. The village isn't completely sustainable, but they've done a lot to reduce their ecological and carbon footprints. In 1979, one of the first privately owned wind turbines in the Highlands region of Scotland was installed to provide electricity at Findhorn, and three more have since been added. In 1995, they installed a first-of-its-kind-in-Europe natural wastewater treatment plant called The Living Machine, using engineered ecology. Their gardening methods, magic aside, focus on permaculture, a practice based on systems thinking, biomimicry, and sustainability. They're still working on reducing the footprint of their transportation and heating energy expenditures, which still rely partially on fossil fuels, but their ecological footprint appears to be about half that of the average in the UK. I have to note that while Findhorn hopes to be a model of sustainable living for the rest of the world, if everyone lived like they do, they wouldn't have a reason to go to Findhorn as tourists, and there goes almost all of the income they need to continue operating. This is a little paradoxical, but it's another theme that comes up often in my research of alternative communities. They want to be self-sufficient, frequently with some form of socialist ideals, but they don't have the resources or economic chops to make it without relying on outside money. So what is life at Findhorn actually like? In the 1990s, the British Channel 4 network made a three-part documentary series on Findhorn that included a ton of interviews and footage at the village, which gives a really good idea of life there. I did find it on YouTube, but I don't think the account that uploaded it had permission to, and it linked back to a really, really insane website, so I'm not going to link to it in the show notes. But guess what? I watched it, so you won't have to. The things I do for you guys. In one of the early scenes, they show a solstice gathering featuring a potluck-style meal of a bunch of omelets and a few dozen frumpy people slowly shambling around a room, warbling out some sort of hymn-type song well above their natural vocal registers. I was about ready to write this creepy, boring place off from the get-go, but wait. Soon they cut to another gathering featuring a shaman sort of crawling around on the floor, banging on a tambourine and shrieking, while blindfolded people clumsily hop and shimmy around the room. This looks like a lot more fun. I've actually been to something pretty similar to this before, but that's a story for another time. Daily life at Findhorn usually consists of meditation, sometimes group singing and activities, and a bit of work according to whichever department you are assigned to, such as cooking, maintenance, or working in the gardens. The famed Findhorn Gardens may be the most well-known of the village's accomplishments. One of the main strategies in Findhorn gardening is the Dorothy McLean developed practice of attunement, which seems to involve talking to the plants, connecting energetically with the plants through the Davic dimension, and asking for cooperation from the plants, even trying to get permission to pick a flower or vegetable. Beings like fairies, elves, gnomes, angels, and nature spirits assist in the process. Even the pagan god Pan plays a role. I know plenty of sane people who talk to their plants, and in fact, some research shows that plants do respond to more stimuli than many people acknowledge. 
Dubious claims that plants respond to music have been around for many years, but more recent research does suggest that plants have some innate ability to perceive certain types of sound, like trickling water and insects. Plants appear to be very sensitive to vibrations. So maybe this idea isn't really all that out there, but for me personally, if I'm hungry and I want to pick a tomato, I'm just gonna pick it, even if it says no. I hope that doesn't make me a bad person. I used to spend some time at a Taoist hermitage, which had a small farm for produce, and they did talk to the plants, in Chinese of course, and they also talked to animals like rabbits and deer, letting them know it was okay to eat some of their garden, but only nibble off the ends of rows and don't eat too much. And they had a great garden and sold their produce to local restaurants. Plant communication aside, why is gardening such a big deal at Findhorn anyway? It's partly because the poor sandy soil on this cold, windswept peninsula in the North Sea just outside the Arctic Circle, would normally be considered a terrible place for gardening. Yet their gardens are lush and productive. Either the nature spirits are taking care of the details, or the local microclimate, vast quantities of horse manure brought in from nearby farms, and near 24-hour light during the growing season have something to do with it. All details conveniently left out of the more magical interpretations of Findhorn's success. Other northern locales like Alaska are also known for growing ridiculously gigantic vegetables with the simple explanation of the photosynthesis supercharging power of up to 20 hours of daylight in the land of the midnight sun. Findhorn is at about the same latitude as Juneau, Alaska, but hey, Maybe it's the fairies. If you want to see some ladies dressed up as cabbages, posing for a photo with some actual 90-pound cabbages, check the show notes. The record-holding cabbage weighed in at almost 140 pounds. If you're wondering why the Findhorn crowd never decamped for a more hospitable locale, they believe that Findhorn lies on a cosmic power point or energy locus. It kind of reminds me of the Sedona Vortexes in the American Southwest, a supposed nexus of spiritual energy tied to a particular geographic location. The simpler explanation is that as rugged as the Scottish Highlands may be, it's also incredibly beautiful and they love their home. Another idea that gets a bad rap, but maybe isn't as crazy as it sounds, is tree hugging. Yes, that quintessential hippie pastime. In the Haven documentary, Findhorn visitors on an initiation week program head into the forest to explore a personal connection with nature. It starts out pretty basic, with some people meditating quietly among the trees and others asking for advice from forest spirits. The shaman I mentioned earlier with the tambourine searches the forest for a willing tree, wraps himself around it, rubs the bark, and explains how he feels the energy resonating through him and compares it to a sexual connection and a state of sheer bliss. In another clip of the same outing, an enthusiastic woman strips nude, jumps in a frigid pond, and declares she's communing with the mermaids. Okay, some of you may have just reached your jumping off point here, so let's talk about why this isn't as weird as you think. The Japanese have a wonderful term for this idea of communing with nature for health and spiritual benefits. They call it forest bathing, and it's a way of describing taking in the forest with all of your senses, restoring vitality and reducing stress and worry. There isn't anything you have to do except be somewhere with plants or trees and fresh air and take the time to be present with nature. Anybody who spends time outdoors already knows what I'm talking about. And if you've never had the opportunity for outdoor recreation, but you can get to a park or a garden somewhere in your city, even just sitting in the grass and staring up at the leaves can be extremely restorative. 
It's not just hippy-dippy bullshit, I promise you. Okay, so I've made fun of some of the more out-there aspects of life at Findhorn, but here's the thing. They don't have a litmus test of beliefs for their members. You just have to live by the one principle of love, and as long as your beliefs don't harm another person, you're okay. You don't have to be into forest spirits or mermaids. This is one area where Findhorn differs from many other utopian communities, and perhaps is part of the reason it never evolved into a more rigid or cult-like group. Beliefs at Findhorn are not mandatory. One of the more popular books on Findhorn is The Magic of Findhorn by journalist Paul Hawkins. It was published in 1975 and doesn't seem to be widely available anymore, but I found it on the Internet Archive. That's just a little tip for me to you for when you're looking for a book that you can't find. Apparently, a lot of the books I want to read are old, weird, and out of print. Okay, back to The Magic of Findhorn. It's a well-written book, but the author certainly avails himself of some flowery language. For example, I had assumed the British to be a tired race, exhausted in a vain world conquest, a society wandering in the trackless maze of cultural decline, and the cotter moving slowly between the thin stand of oats with his head bowed to the dirt, seemed to carry his motherland's fatigue as his heritage. The continual cropping of oats and barley having nursed the agricultural teats dry, the exhaustion of an empire was now mirrored in the glazed eyes of its tiller, and in his croft of marginal soil, which appeared as useless as a hag's breast in a nursery. Uh, okay? All this to describe a random stranger standing in a field as the author rode by on a train. The book is ostensibly an account of the author's visit to Findhorn as a skeptic, but, spoiler alert, he drinks the Kool-Aid immediately and ends up writing a very magical account of the community as suggested by the title. Part of the first chapter of the book reads, Findhorn may be a manifestation of a light and power which could transform our planet within a lifetime. Or it could be an illusory bubble on the troubled water of the world civilization that will burst, leaving no traces. Sitting here today, over 40 years after those words were written, I think we can say that the former statement never came to pass. Findhorn's messages of spirituality and sustainability never broke through to the mainstream. Findhorn is still considered a leader in the realm of experimental eco-villages, but that's a world with a limited audience. I'm guessing many of you listening have never heard of Findhorn, especially if you're under age 60. So why didn't Findhorn's brand of open-ended spirituality and sustainable practices catch on? Why didn't the village become the model for the wider world that they hoped? Why didn't they change the world? My take is that it's probably for the same reasons that the wider sustainability movement has only progressed by baby steps and in fits and starts over the last 50 plus years, and world peace hasn't yet arrived. It's just human nature. Ideas that don't make somebody a whole lot of money don't tend to really take off. Today, as the world measurably hurdles toward ecological collapse, arguments for saving our future by preserving our planet's ability to support life as we know it still fall largely on the deaf ears of the world's decision makers and voters. The only way forward is very likely an economic boom based on renewable energy and green jobs to provide a financial incentive for sustainable innovation. Of course, the other option is always to just keep going until we hit rock bottom and then try to react with risky and desperate moonshots like geoengineering and mass human migration. While their ideas may not have had the wider impact they hoped, the Findhorn community is still here. Even after Eileen Caddy's death in 2006, the community carried on. They understood that their social ecosystem must not depend on one individual or rigid dogma 
in order to continue on in perpetuity. This development differs from many instances of alternative communities and cults, which tend to be based on having an all-powerful leader with superstar status. Handoffs don't tend to go well, even with succession planning. There could have been no Synanon without Chuck Dieterich and no People's Temple without Jim Jones. Finthorn had a dispersed model of leadership, more like a democracy than a dictatorship. And I have to wonder if that insulated them from potential abuse by an untouchable leader with too much influence over the lives of others. Despite Eileen Caddy's claims of being the recipient of God's word, she never abused that by coercing others or claiming to be the sole conduit from God to the rest of the community. Instead, she encouraged every individual to listen for the voice within. It seems that's just who Eileen was. The Findhorn Foundation was recognized with an award from the UN in the late 1990s, and in 2004, the British government honored Eileen by making her a member of the British Empire, or MBE, for her dedication and service to spiritual inquiry. She was invited to international speaking engagements, and she wrote several books over the years, which all have excellent reader reviews. But despite the recognition she received over the years, she remained humble and unassuming and never self-aggrandized. Her jam was empowering other people with her spiritual philosophies. What do you think of the Findhorn Eco Village? Is it just a strange place for a few new agey type people that could never gain traction in the real world? Or is it a successful example of a utopian community that has survived over 50 years, is still thriving, and never turned into a cult? Have they succeeded or have they failed? As with most things, the truth usually lies somewhere in the middle. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and leave a rating or review on Apple Podcasts to help other people find it. Tell your friends about it, and if you want to support the pod directly and help keep new episodes coming, you can donate to the show through the link in the show notes. Connect and stay in the loop on the website, failedutopia.com, or the Facebook page at Failed Utopia Pod. Failed Utopia episodes are written and produced by me, Anna Roberts. The burning palm tree painting featured on the cover is by artist Perry Vasquez. My intro music is by Elliot Middleton. See you next time. Special thanks on this episode go to the Peterson Farm Bros for the use of their song, I'm Farming and I Grow It. If you enjoy hilarious agriculture-themed parody songs, you'll dig their YouTube channel.